name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Today is the sixth Sunday of the Holy Fifty. A happy Father's Day to everybody. It's a feast day. I'm just kidding. Uh, I want to focus today on uh, verse 31. Today's gospel comes from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 16. And I want to focus on verse 31 to the end. It says, Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? The hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered every man to his home and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said this to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I'm going to ask that this is turned down a little bit. This is a, a little bit intense for me. St. Isaac the Syrian, he said, The door to heaven is opened for a man by the hand of his trials. I'm going to say that again. The door to heaven is opened for a man by the hand of his trials. It is not possible that God should benefit the man who longs to be with him otherwise than by giving trials upon him for the sake of truth. The question for today that I wanted to contemplate is, why does it have to be so hard? This is a question I asked myself many times. It's a common question that I hear from a lot of people, maybe in the context of confession, and one that I think that we've all asked at various times in our lives. Why does life have to be so hard? In the United States, we are lonelier, more depressed, more fragile, more emotionally troubled than ever. And it reminds us that when we imagine and engineer a world without God, we get ungodly results. It's been said that we are born spiritually hungry and thirsty. And without an infinite God that we can know and who knows us intimately, that hunger will remain. There's no proper way to fill that void other than God. Of all the issues, these are all symptoms of a worldview that makes God distant, makes him irrelevant, uh, irrelevant, makes him completely non-existent. Our Lord Jesus Christ took flesh and became man to show us a better way. And that's the good news. He took flesh to become one of us. He took flesh, and he knows our limitations. He knows fatigue. He knows hunger. He knows pain. He took our flesh and entered into time and space to be part of our lives. During this season, we reflect on the triumph of Christ over death and his promise of our victory in and with him. In the Acts of the Apostles, we see how Christ continues to preach the gospel and works signs through his apostles. Christ continues to be present in this world. And he is present in the continued trampling down death by death. It continues. In fact, according to the Acts of the Apostles, it is often these very signs that lead to the persecution and tribulation. It provides an opportunity for his disciples to follow in Christ's trampling down death on death. For example, when St. Paul and Barnabas were preaching in the gospel uh, in the town of Lystra, this is in Acts chapter 14, by the grace of God, St. Paul heals a man who who is crippled from birth. Maybe we're familiar with the story. And then this leads to a profound misunderstanding All the people think that St. Paul and St. Barnabas are pagan gods and they want to offer sacrifices to them. And when St. Paul and Barnabas figure out what's going on, they tear their clothes and run among the people telling them that they're men. They're men. And they should restrain from uh, sacrificing to them. As often as this happens, misunderstandings leads to frustrations. And frustration leads to violence. 
And urged by some enemies of truth, the crowd, they dragged St. Paul out of the city and they stoned him, apparently to death. And after the crowd left, the disciples gathered around him in prayer. And St. Paul got up. He arose. He arose like our master Christ, trampling down death by death. And unless we think that St. Paul, in his experience and of following Christ's example of suffering and death, was an exception, we are told immediately after this account that St. Paul went to all the churches, strengthening and encouraging the disciples by saying to them the following, We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. St. Isaac the Syrian said, No one has ascended into heaven by means of ease. For we know where the way of ease leads and how it ends. No one has ascended to heaven by means of ease. This should give us comfort. And even the way of ease, as many of us have found out, is not that easy. <laughs> Worries and illnesses and, and discipline and Self-control are encountered and required no matter where we are and what we do in this world. The way of ease is not really an easy way. The way of ease is just the way of the world. It's my way. It's the way I want things. A way that leads the heart away from God. A way that is led by passion a way that's led by impulse, a way that's led by isolation and delusion and fear. But the very unavoidable sufferings of this world, whether it's illnesses or misunderstandings and violence, they are also a means of salvation. If we embrace them in Christ, it really does seem like trials and tribulations and suffering of all sorts, it creates a moment of decision. We're like at a fork in the road. We have a moment of choice, a crisis in which we must choose. Either we will humble us ourselves and turn to God in our pain and our confusion, or we'll turn the other way. And we turn away from God and we try to handle it ourselves. I got this. We will lift up our hearts. The question is, will we lift up our hearts and our hands to God and beg for mercy, believing that our whole life is in his hands, the good and the bad, the joyful and the painful, or will we turn away, maybe in anger, maybe in pride, maybe this simple unwillingness to admit that we're really not in control of our lives. St. Isaac said, the door of heaven is opened by the hand of trials. The hand of trials. Whether we enter or not is up to us. That's our choice. If we enter, or maybe better said, if we seek to enter then the trial becomes a means of personal transformation. It becomes a context for a new and deeper intimacy with God. It becomes an opportunity to love others as God loves us. If we don't, if we turn away from God, then the trial becomes meaningless. The suffering is just pain, and it's now is empty. God seems far away, and instead of polishing us and transforming us to be more like ourselves, more like our better selves, the selves that we hope to be, that we long to be, instead of this, the sufferings eats away at us, produces bitterness, 
it drives us into a way that blames everything and everyone else. And it makes love stingy. We deal it out in small bits, if that. Something that shrinks and does not grow in us, love. So where do we turn when things go bad? Where do we go for help? In our culture, people turn to everything from yoga to video games to substances, both legal and illegal. And as a people, we have become quite good at searching for help in obscure places. But I think we forgot to look up to heaven. One of the most important lessons in this gospel passage is that we have to come to the full realization that our only true help is in the Lord. In our daily lives, it's easy to fall into the habit of turning to God only in cases of a complete emergency, of a dire emergency. When God is a safety net, that means he's secondary. That means he's not primary. God can't be a safety net. God has to be our first thought in our lives. He knows our struggles. He knows our pain. He doesn't know them from a distant, faraway place. He knows these struggles and these pains intimately because he has dwelt among us. He's one of us. When there are many questions and no answers in sight, where do we turn? Does God become another one of the questions, or does he become the only answer? Yes, there will be trouble. This is what Christianity preaches. Any other Christianity that doesn't preach this is misunderstood. They're confused. There will be trouble. There will be trials. There is a cross. There is sickness. There is death. But our Lord says to us, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome it. He suffered and overcame all the tribulation of the world in order to graciously share that victory with each one of us. This is the promise. It's only a matter of time before we will each have to face some of these great difficulties. Maybe we're facing them today. Everything in life is turned on its head by the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything is given new meaning when we live in the reality of the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our life is not our own. It belongs to Christ. We have nothing to fear if Christ is with you. But without Christ in your life, you will fear everything. As Christians, we are not guaranteed peaceful and comfortable lives. We have mostly lived in comfort, but we should always be ready for trials and difficulties. Always be ready. St. Paul has a word for us in case we do run into trials and difficult circumstances. He says we should be patient in tribulation. Be patient in tribulation. But how? How can we go on when we feel great difficulties in our lives? How do we manage when we feel that we are under a cloud and unable to lift up our heads? St. Paul tells us the answer. It's so simple. And I think sometimes we take it for granted. We think it's a Sunday school answer. St. Paul says, continue steadfastly in prayer. Continue in prayer. Steadfastly in prayer. We take it for granted. Prayer is our bridge to God. And God is our only source of strength and hope. 
One of the fathers says, Prayer is food for the soul. Prayer is food for the soul. Do not starve the soul. It's better to let the body go hungry. Do not starve the soul. When we are most hungry and most thirsty and most weak, that's when it's easiest to give up. It's oftentimes when we turn to our smartphones, our televisions, our substances, but these things are thieves. They're robbers. They steal your attention. They take away your life. They take your heart. And they offer you very little in return. It seems like a cheap thrill. And that is precisely the wrong solution to our situation. It's precisely when we should be most diligent and eager to do the work and to run to Christ in prayer. So just some concluding thoughts. As we, as long as we live in this world, there will be suffering. There will be trials. There will be tribulation. There is no escaping it. The world is broken. Sin has distorted everything. What remains for us is not whether or not we will suffer. It's not any of that, but whether or not, like Christ, we find life in death. It's whether or not we will, like Christ, be willing to lay down our lives for one another. It's whether or not, like Christ, we will be transformed and transfigured and drawn closer and closer to our Heavenly Father by drinking willingly the cup that has been given to us, the cup of trials, the cup of suffering in this life. I pray that we can trust him and have hope in him, that we can be victorious in him. We find comfort in pure prayer with Christ. Everything else will pass away, but what we have cultivated between us and God will remain forever. This is the victory. This is our hope. And in this hope, we will be conquerors with Christ, the victorious King. And glory be to God forever. Amen.